Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome. Welcome to the August Data Science Happy Hour. It is Friday, August 5th. This is happy hour number 91. Damn, 91 of these things. That's a trip. Nine more. We'll be at 100. The only person to be at more happy hours than me is Russell Willis. Russell, thank you so much for your continued attendance at the happy hour. Super excited to have you guys here. Shout out to all the homies in Salt Lake City. Uh, the the usual suspects of the happy hour are all hanging out at the uh, content creators house, which I wish I could be there uh, with y'all. Uh, I know all of us wish we could be there with y'all. So hopefully y'all are having fun. Uh, and home studio is so, so close to perfection. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, of, of just a couple of things. Hopefully by this time next week, hopefully next Friday will be the grand reveal. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I will be going back to recording some podcast episodes this Wednesday, that is August 10th at 11 a.m. Central Time. I'm live streaming with the folks from Tonic AI, the fake data company. Uh, definitely tune in and check that out. I think it will be a wonderful conversation. Fake data is something that um, I've never really played around with. I've never had a use case for it. I think it'll be interesting to, to talk to them about that and see how people are using uh, fake data in their um, kind of data science workflows and machine learning workflows. Uh, I just wrapped up my first week here at Desi AI. Uh, started on Wednesday, the middle of the week. Um, Cause you know why not? Wednesday is a good day to start work on your first day. Uh, so I just wrapped up the first week at Desi AI. I just go through the onboarding process. I'm their new developer relations manager. Uh, so I'm excited to just you know, kind of kickstart the uh, DevRel practice there and just do some awesome stuff, man. Uh, couldn't be more happy to, uh, to have a job that's just focused entirely on deep learning and computer vision, um, beyond excited to, to have this opportunity. So keep an eye out for more content from me, um, specifically, you know, deep learning and computer vision related content. Uh, you know, do some cool, fun, interesting projects on the side. Might even do some projects where I, uh, you know, deploy stuff to edge devices we'll see we'll see how all this goes man it's gonna be a lot of fun um that being said guys thank you so much for being here shout out to everyone in the building serge what's up russell christian jay eric jacob subash in the building what's going on y'all um so let's go ahead and kick it off man if you guys have questions if you're in the room right now and you got a question do let me know just drop a question right there in the chat if you're tuning in Live on LinkedIn or on YouTube, feel free to drop your question right there in the comment section. If you want to join us in the room, send me a message and I'll get you a link to the uh, to, to the session. It'll be a lot of fun to have you all here. Um, that being said, let's let's kick off the question with, with the stream. Uh, sorry, let's kick off the stream with a question. Uh, yeah, so here's the question: um, If you weren't in data, if you weren't in the data science field, data analyst, data engineer, whatever your thing is, if you weren't in the data or tech space, what field would you be working in? Um, I'm going to go like the complete anti route, dude. If, if, if I could, if like money were not an issue at all, I would just be a pizza delivery guy. I would absolutely love that job because I just get to drive around because I love driving. I absolutely love driving. Uh, drive around, listen to music, listen to audiobooks, listen to podcasts, and uh, I also love pizza. So um, I might be stealing slices of pizza from the pizza box too. If I'm a pizza delivery guy, um, but you know, I'm curious to hear about what y'all would be into. Um, I think you know, I probably still be doing content creation in some form, but I don't know who on LinkedIn like to hear thoughts of a uh, pizza delivery guy. Um, but it would be interesting to do that nonetheless. Uh, Serge, let's hear from you, man. What would you be doing if you weren't in data science? And if anybody else wants to go next, um, I will volunteer, uh, volunteer you guys. So we'll go with Serge and we'll go to Christian. Um, and if you're tuning in, feel free to uh, let me know in the chat what you'd be doing if you weren't in data science. Serge, go for it. Well, um, when I, when I decided to study computer science, like the things I were passionate about were the internet. Uh, spreadsheets, and uh, that's that's kind of the genesis of this whole data thing. And the internet is the whole genesis of how I became a web developer. But there was also graphics. I was very interested in what was going on with graphics back then. You know, with Pixar and video games finally becoming like photorealistic and special effects and so on. So yeah, I I went down that rabbit hole a bit. You know, I. I, I'm very good at 
3D modeling and I can hold my weight in 3D animation, you know, but I, I didn't go far enough to actually, you know, become professional. I did do an internship actually in Canada and Ottawa in uh, animation studio, um, you know, um, making like props for a, a, a video game. And I loved it. <laughs> so chances are I'd be working in that field, right? I'd be in, in video games or in special effects for movies or something like that. And it's a trip. That's like an actual career path that people have, right? Like in video games, whether you're designing the video game, whether you're coding it up, um, just playing it, testing it, you know, uh, in terms of user acceptance of it, or even building communities around it. Um, like the internet really has opened up a lot of opportunities uh, to do a lot of cool shit that Casey have not yet noticed. Uh, but Christian, go for it. Um, and then after Christian, let's go to, uh, to Eric Sims. Then after Eric Sims, let's go to Jay. Jacob, good to see you again, man. Uh, if you want to go, let me know. Uh, those of y'all tuning in on LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you are, feel free to comment right there in the chat. Smash that like, smash reaction, and uh, feel free to join us as well. Go for Appreciate it, it Harpreet. Um, yeah, so for me, I'd say I would tie it back to my roots, my academic roots, um, and then getting some an internship experience at Kohler Company in product marketing. I would say that product marketing would be where I'd, where I'd stand right now. It's more of the analytical side of marketing. So you're still getting a lot of exposure, especially at manufacturing companies to the engineering side of it. Lo actually learning about the build of the products and how you can position it in the marketplace, doing competitor skew analysis in Excel um and internal skew analysis as well for pricing so that's probably where i'd be to be honest yeah marketing is is awesome man like you know the, the role of developer relations that i'm currently in it kind of has um well it is in marketing um but i never really appreciated marketing until like last year uh there's such sure it's, it's such a creative like, like interesting field there's like elements of psychology in there like you've got to be a decent writer you got to you gotta experiment a lot too. Um, but yeah, marketing, marketing is cool, man. I, I, you know, what's Navarro be not to say? If you can both build and sell, you'll be unstoppable. So if you can have like that foundation of like a, a data scientist background coupled with, you know, marketing chops, be unstoppable. Um, Eric, let's hear from you. Yeah, so uh, I've kind of done a bunch of different stuff over the past, 10 years or so. And, uh, I've really liked a lot of it. And so if money, I mean, if money was no object, like I would, I would have a homestead. I would just have like a, a, a hobby farm or whatever. And, you know, just a few acres, like, cause I mean, you know, if you, if you have like a vegetarian diet, you can grow like all your food on a, just a couple acres. And, uh, so I would totally be into homesteading, uh, slash gardening. I once upon a time owned a laundromat and uh, it was legit. I, I liked it. I would, I would, love to have a laundromat again give it a give it a try um spend time obviously I, I like i like learning and dabbling in tons of different things so i would just continue learning and dabbling but i'm going to continue doing that anyway um and i guess if, if money was an object that's even like a, a saying since it is um i worked in marketing before uh i got into data and i enjoyed it and so i would probably be doing that still It'd be uh, so dope to own like a parking lot. I've been wanting to own a parking lot for like ever. Like, that's the least, yes, least overhead like business that that you could think of. Right, just charge people like ten bucks an hour just to put their car somewhere. Or storage uh, units. Yeah. I I think it would be cool to own storage units. Every now and then you get those people that don't pay, and so you like end up like putting a lock on their storage unit and then auction it off and find out what the heck was actually in it. That could be exciting. <laughs> But the thing about storage unit is like you still have to like like either buy the storage or whatever. A parking lot is just like space. You can have a parking lot that's True. Just gravel. People don't even pay <laughs> it, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh let's go to uh let's hear from 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 Jay. Uh and by the way, if you got questions, please do let me know right there in the chat. Go for Jay. So if I weren't in data, I would probably be in um, some type of meteorological field because um, I've been very much a weather nerd since very, very young. And that's that hasn't really gone away. And so I still try to keep up with, you know, not just like, oh, that's how the weather is. But like, okay, why is this happening? What features 
like what ter what what terrain features cause this to happen. It's just very interesting. To me. So I would probably. Be uh, that that's got elements of data too, right? Like that, that's got to have um, some type of predictive modeling and stuff for weather. Are you so are you talking about weather in terms of like trying to like forecast weather, or are there other elements of weather that um, that I'm probably not familiar with? Um, growing up, the two things that well, no, the one thing that interested me the most is um, the tropics, so hurricane formations, that sort of stuff. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, jump to this question. Russell's got a question here in the chat. Um, Russell, go for it. Uh... Okay, thanks, Alfred. Uh, I did have a quick response to the question about the your, your um, uh, careers, if you want me to, to hit that before I go to my question quickly. Yes, yes, please do. Uh, so it was actually a bit complicated for me. So I'm, I'm quite a creative person. So I think I could have easily gone into uh, food like being a chef, but I'd want to bring some creative and kind of science to it, a bit like um, Heston Blumenthal does. I don't know if you guys know him over in the States. I think that would have been fascinating. Uh, but also something more artistic, like being simply an artist or perhaps being an actor, you know, working in some of these great film productions, you know, even some of those really high tech ones like Star Wars, the Marvel franchise, I think that would be fascinating. Uh, but truly, if money was no object and I had enough money to do whatever I wanted, I'd like to set up a a charity, just just going around the world and just kind of enriching people's lives, doing whatever I could to do so. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, love it, man. And uh, I think you'd make a great Jedi if you ever were to become a uh, actor. Right, right, Jedi vibes for sure. Uh, I've got I've got the beard, and I'm getting a bit of the Kenobi coloring in it as well. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that going on here. Uh, Russell, uh, go for your uh, question as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So, so my question was, uh, if you were just starting out in the field of data, and I, by that I mean the wide field of data, not just data science, data analytics, uh, even business uh, analytics, etc., uh, how could you best maintain a technology agnostic approach to learning everything data? You know, to try to try and keep as broad a field of um, uh, awareness for everything, so as not to um, to blinker and hyper focus on one thing. That's an interesting question. So, how do how to maintain a technology agnostic approach to, to learning? Uh, so, so I mean, I guess a glib answer that I would probably say is start just learning fundamentals learning basics and then maybe carve out one day a week where you just go through the hello world documentation of of some new tool or technology um, and just kind of see what fits what what resonates with you and just kind of stick with that um, but let's let's go to eric i know you like to play around with a lot of different you know libraries and frameworks and tools and things like that what's your approach like for that yeah so it's kind of so quick maybe clarification russell when you say tech agnostic are you saying like tech agnostic as in theoretical or tech agnostic as in you kind of have like dabbled across different technologies you know what i mean when i hear tech agnostic i think not like no platform primarily theoretical yeah, I was, I was trying to be really broad so that you wouldn't concentrate on any one uh, coding language, you know, um, Python versus R, if you really want to trigger people, or SQL, or, or, or anything. Um, maybe uh, 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 TensorFlow, if you want to uh, uh, trigger Ben Taylor, uh, et cetera. But just as, as, as open to anything, you know, to allow yourself to meander through the data environment so, uh, so you didn't rule out any one thing by doubling down on, on something else. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. To me, that sounds like, I mean, I keep a pretty open mind and I'll try, I try different stuff. Um, but I kind of like finding something that I can like, that resonates with me or like that I understand, like, oh, I can actually read this documentation. Like I can understand it. Like trying, like I've tried to read some of like, 
I still don't exactly understand like NLTK versus Spacey, but I can read Spacey's documentation. It's clear. I like it. And so like I could go and try and figure out NLTK, but like Spacey's here and it works well and I know it's popular. So like I just keep, keep reading it. Um, and so sometimes for me, I guess I kind of like take a little bit of a different approach. Like I'm open to whatever's out there, but if I find something that's working well for me, the world is so big that if I find something that's going to work for me, I think I'm just going to grab it and try and, and, and get, get used to it until another tool comes along that like supplants it. But otherwise I don't, I don't think there's anything like terribly wrong with like grabbing a technology that you like and just keeping an open mind that one of these days that technology may not be the best solution for the job anymore. That's my approach. And love to hear your perspective from like kind of like the leadership type of level. Um, I don't know if you caught caught the question that uh, Russell was asking. So Russell, if you want to quickly kind of uh, read it, reiterate, restate the question for Ben, uh, that'd be helpful. Sure. Uh, hi, Ben. So I was saying if uh, anybody was uh, breaking into the data um, landscape right now, so not just data science, but anything data, data analytics, data engineering, business analytics, et cetera, how best could you maintain a technology agnostic approach so that you try to learn the, the maximum broad field capability without, you know, hyper-focusing on any one thing, say, Python, R, or TensorFlow, Python, those types of things. Just uh, and, and if you caught the, the back end of Eric's um, answer, I think he had a, he had a great um, answer immediately, keeping an open mind. I think that's one of the best things to do. But um, yeah, what else could you add to that? I think you continually listen to people that talk about the weaknesses of the things that you like. And that's been, for me, that's how I've kept kind of rational. Because I used to hate Python. Absolutely. I was one of the haters and was until like 2017. I, I was I was that guy you know, talking about coding stuff in Java and C and I was that guy. And Python turned me around. It really did. It And listening to people who were developing with it and what they could do with it. And I think you could do that with everything. You can do that with programming languages. You can do that with libraries. You can do that with software and platforms. You can do that with approaches, you know, even research. You, you can say that, you know, especially listening to a lot of the rubs on the way that deep learning research is going right now. I've learned a lot personally about where different thinkers believe the field is going and what alternative approaches there are out there. So I think really just listen to people who disagree and who bring up some, some points about why your stuff isn't awesome. I like that approach. I kind of take that same approach when I'm like looking for shit to buy on Amazon. I always go and look at like the, one or two star reviews and just that's it uh dude huge shout out to the data creators house like the like, it was so awesome. shit. this is this is awesome what's up everyone uh damn good to see all y'all here man uh thanks for tuning in tom uh how y'all doing i don't know what the uh, audio situation is like for y'all but hopefully you can hear and, uh, and and chat but dude so good to see uh so good to see all y'all here um Let's uh, let's go to Serge for the uh, next response, and then while the uh, content creators' house gets uh, settled in, uh, get on you guys next. I'm sorry, I'm a bit spaced out. I I don't even know if I remember the question. It was um something about uh, it was related to the previous que the, the original question about what would you do with data. I'm sorry. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much how could you maintain a tech agnostic approach yeah. to learning yeah. the field of data science? Tech agnostic. Well, I feel my response will be kind of a bore because a truly like tech agnostic way is just like going back to the roots and it's all about the math and the statistics and, and you know, but I mean, there's, there's tech agnostic ways to kind of exercise that, um, the statistical muscle, right? Um, whether it's whatever's your passion, like probably Kenji will uh, will agree with me. But you know, like sports are chock full of statistics. So if you're a sports geek, 
you know, like it, it's fairly easy for you to kind of gather all these stats about players and teams and, and, and kind of come up with predictions. Like, I think even, you know, children do that if they're passionate about sports. So you don't, you don't really need any tech for that. And, um, you know, it, it might be something else, you know, it, it might be like dungeon and dungeons and dragons, you know, it could be something else or it could be chess or whatever, whatever is your passion, right? Um, if you're a collector, it could be about your collection you know, statistics about your collection. So I, I think there's many avenues to become like a data geek without even touching a computer <laughs> or, or maybe just using like a spreadsheet, any spreadsheet, right? So I, I don't think you really have to learn Python or R or SQL uh, to exercise that, that, that muscle. And then by the time you start, you know, programming, you you know, like you're just, uh, you suddenly have all this power and you know how to channel it. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so Russell's saying pretty much break everything down to the basics, then use any tool. Uh, Jay, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Uh, Jay or Christian, you want to go next or let me know. Uh, Christian, go for it. I, I can go. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak on a data science perspective, to be honest, but at least just getting into the weeds with data engineering and BI engineering specifically, I'm finding that, again, going back to the basics, yes, Kimball dimensional modeling, relying on those fundamental engineering textbooks have really, really helped me because data modeling is going to be applied the same way that you'd apply it in any data warehouse. So yeah, going back to the basics um, from the standpoint of, you know, any well-known uh, modeling um, theory would, would, would be my suggestion. Christian, thank you very much. Uh, Jay, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Jay says he's about to work about the abacus and do some, uh, some, some calculations. By the way, if you're tuning in on LinkedIn or on YouTube, if you got questions, please leave them below right there in the comment section. I'll be happy to uh, address your questions. And if you're in the room and you got a question, uh, do let me know. Um, and then we'll go to Coast of after uh, Jay. Coast of, I did not see that you're very good to see you, my friend. Jay? And um, I don't really have uh, too much more to, to add other than I am in uh, complete agreement with going back to you know, your basic stats. That, that's the most, I guess you could say, tech agnostic way to do it. Like knowing how things work on paper, deriving things uh, on your own to understand what's really happening in the background, and then finding a tool from there to be able to apply what you know and to see if you can find um, from there if what you thought was true is true or not. So. Costa, let's hear from you. Hey, guys. Um, so there's a couple of things, right? So I'll come at it more from like a machine learning engineering standpoint than say data science specifically. And this has been a challenge for me because I've been working with robotics and then a little bit of cloud work. So it's more forced me to be a bit more agnostic because I haven't had the chance to play with just one set of tooling for a particularly long time. Um, but essentially going back to your basics on data flow diagrams and things like that, right? Your, your fundamental data engineering and software engineering and just engineering concepts, right? That stuff doesn't really change irrespective of whether you're coding it in C++, Python, there'll be slight, like, slight differences here and there. Um, and obviously when you're doing things in the cloud, there are tools that'll take over, but a, a PubSub messaging system in, in ROS for, for robotics is no different to a PubSub messaging system on on gcloud on, on on gcp right uh, fundamentally it works the same way all you have to do is figure out what does gcp offer that fits into this space that previously i was doing with a particular robotics middleware or i was doing with an aws um you know component there so uh, that's one way to kind of be agnostic is just understanding things like data flow diagrams state machines um those real real basic concepts of engineering 
right? Um, that's powerful. And a lot of people don't understand it. And they end up with really messed up data setups. Um, so that's, it's, it's, you make your life easier when you do things right, in a sense. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, let me flip it on its head is, so there's two ways to balance uh, a, a, a seesaw, right? One way is to have no weight on either end. And the other way is to have exactly the same amount of weight on both ends. So if you're trying to learn agnostic to AWS or GCP, for example, why not try to do the exact same task in AWS one week and the next week do it in GCP? Uh, it's not tech agnostic, but it's so tech broad that it's forcing you to be tech agnostic in a sense, right? You end up boiling out those fundamental concepts. If I have to write the same code in C++, in Java, and in Python, uh, fundamentally, I boil down the, the, the underlying principle behind that piece of code, irrespective of which language it's in. And then I start to surface the subtle differences between each language, right? So, yeah, that's another way to approach it, I guess. Uh, Eric saying that uh, Coach the Ball is coming with the philosophical answer that blows our minds. I agree. So, uh, real quick before we get to Christians, uh, Coach, the question for you then. Um, you're saying just boil everything down to like the, the, the fundamental kind of pieces of, of the code. So, like, how does one do that? Is that just trying to figure out what it is that you are fundamentally trying to do and then just find the simplest code that does that? Like, how, do you, how do you determine that? If that question makes sense. Um, so there's, I mean, you've got to recognize when it's not in the simplest format, right? And that's, that's always the toughest part. That's why this is not an easy job, is recognizing when it's not at its fundamental level. Um, that's a really tough question to answer, to be honest. I don't think I always manage to identify it. So there's probably people with way more experience here who have identified it more often than me. But that's the mindset that I've been applying is, is looking at, okay, what's the core principle that I can get down to the bottom of? Um, and I'm, I'm convinced that I don't always get down to the bottom of it. But, I mean, if you, if you spend a bunch of time listening to guys like uh, Robert Martin, you know, Uncle Bob, and some of these classic software engineering textbooks, you go back and read it, Kenny and Richie, it, that stuff doesn't really change. Right, like a lot of it doesn't really change. There's um, pragmatic programmer. There's a bunch of these books where the advice in there hasn't changed for a good reason. Right, uh, it's still quite applicable. And when you take that advice and start applying it to each thing that you're doing in the workplace, um, that's where I see that. Oh, hang on, there was this extra layer of uh, first principle thinking that I wasn't thinking of. I was abstracting it away for my ease, but really at its core, this is what this thing is. Right. Um, and even just taking a part of the system that I'm working on, and even if it already exists somewhere that someone else knows about, but mapping out the data flow diagram for it, just to understand what am I missing, right? It's great practice to do that for systems that already exist. Uh, and for all you know, you go back and you find an error in the data flow diagram because they wrote it two years ago, and then it's morphed since then because the requirements have changed. And then you go back to them and say, hey, by the way, there's this gap in there. And then a, they appreciate you for it. B, you get a lot of clarity into why it was designed the way it was and why the changes were made. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Coastal. Yeah, there's uh, uh, great recommendations in there, the uh, Pragmatic Programmer by uh, Andy Hunt. I've actually interviewed Andy Hunt on my podcast, guys. Definitely check that out. It's called Become a Pragmatic Data Scientist. Um, Subhash, the comment here says, I always consider technology as a medium to instruct a computer to perform tasks on a human's behalf. And there's always a general solution behind any technology. For example, if we're looking at data visualization tools and technologies, it's important to learn the storytelling and the different charts, visualization best practices, rather than learning Tableau, Power BI, Python, or whatever. As long as you know what needs to be done, you always have documentation to help you with how to do that specific thing using a specific technology. So in my opinion, focusing on learning what needs to be done will help you become technology independent. Subhash, thank you so much, Mario. That is a very, very wise insight. Christian, let's hear from you. Yeah, I just wanted to expand on that. And I 
I kind of blanked on this piece of it, but coming from someone who doesn't have any formal STEM education, and I really just emphasized in information systems in college, but I was actually a marketing major. The catalyst to it all, uh, you know, it, it sparked when, when UDFs were mentioned was systems analysis and design. And that course was so fundamental to me, even just getting interested into the realm of IT and database. So just from experience for someone who doesn't even have any data background academically or online, um, I'm just for them a tip systems analysis and design would be a huge step. So awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you guys got questions, please do keep them coming. I'm monitoring LinkedIn and YouTube and uh, don't see any questions, but I do see Kathy Bailey saying happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too, Kathy. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, shout out to uh, Seth Mandela Ernest also saying that great opportunity. It is a great opportunity to be here on the Arts Day Science Happy Hour. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, question from Eric Sin. Eric, I'm going to go first. All right, so I've actually got two questions. Uh, the first is, does anybody have any good recommendations for like authors, authors, papers, courses, books, whatever, on recommender systems? Because I've been reading, like I've got like my recommender systems textbook and I'm working through it, but like it's way dense, which is fine and helpful, but it doesn't add a lot of like practical, like it doesn't draw a lot of practical context examples it's just talking through like through like the math of it which is just like harder to to actually make the connections and so and also it's, you know it's it's a few years old and so i'm while i'm i'm fine with that because i you know the basics aren't going to change um i don't know how much i don't know how much of the more recent stuff is going to to be in here so that's the first question anybody have any good recommendations uh, do you know who Eugene Yan is? Have you heard of that name, uh, Eugene Yan? Um, I don't think so. He's done a uh, he's done a blog, and actually, he's taken this blog and, and like has put it on the road and, and just talked about it a lot. And it's a system designed for recommendations and search. Um, so there's a link to it right there. So if you want to look it up, it's just Eugene Yan, uh, Y A N system design system designed for a uh, for recommendations and he's also been on uh, Daliana's podcast to talk about how to build successful end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning systems, I think within the context of recommendation systems. Um, so that's probably a, a good place to start, but I'd love to hear from uh, from everyone else. Let's go to Surge, because I imagine Surge has some great uh, resources and then we'll go to Vin after that. Actually, I, I don't really have a lot to add in that discussion, but I, you know, I, I am very much interested in this topic. I, I have seen the posts of Yu Ying Zhang and, and uh, he, he seems to know his stuff. So I'm, I'm gonna be reading this for sure. Yeah. Uh, Vin, what's your me? I think you've hit on one of the areas we don't have a whole lot of good content on. We have a whole lot of surface level content on recommender systems, but there's so much variety there that it's really not possible, at least not in my opinion, to write a comprehensive book about all of the different types of recommender systems because so many problems are recommender problems. So, I mean, the best thing I can tell you is if you have a specific type of recommender or if you have a specific approach that you want to learn about, you're gonna be a lot more successful finding good quality content but when you start talking about like a general high level overview or introduction to recommender systems, all you really get is that kind of what you're talking about, like that surface level, you know, introduction to, but then it doesn't get into any specific approach because every single one of them is a rabbit hole. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Cause I mean, I do have kind of a couple specific things I'm looking at right now just for like my own project. But that, as I got thinking about it, I was like, gosh, I'm like trying to, I have this project idea and I'm cobbling it together and it's, it's fine, but gosh, I'm sure there's somebody who's done this before and I would love to, you know, pay them to show me how they did it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So that's, I guess you know, and that's probably more better. Specific. Yeah. If you go after the project or you go after, you know, you're looking at, you're evaluating multiple approaches and you start looking down 
at each one of the approaches that you're thinking about. You're also, when you Google those approaches with recommender system afterwards, you're going to find, you know, there'll be a this versus that type of post that'll start showing up where they'll compare and contrast different approaches with respect to your problem. And that's where you're probably going to get the most information from. Cool. Serge, uh, I'll still you. Yeah, I, I just want to loop back into what Ben said. I, I totally agree. It's it's a uh, it's why I, I kind of, struggle to find an answer to that because it's just a very vast topic and it really depends on what you know what is it you're trying to emulate what kind of recommendation you're you're trying to to produce um my experience with that space is i i once had a startup and that startup was a search engine slash recommendation system but the way i was going about it was you know, trying trying to reinvent it from the ground up. You know, something completely mm -hmm. new. You know, like Tinder meets, you know, finding something to do. Right. So it it's not yeah. your traditional recommender re recommender system. So, um, yeah. As much as I tried to leverage all the techniques out there, there there was just nothing that could really serve as um, you know a template for what I was trying to do. Um, so, yeah. So it's it's still a, a very interesting topic, and I'd love to learn more. I like that Tinder leads figuring out something to do. Uh, so I've, I've been using that. So back when I was in grad school living in Chicago, uh, my favorite website to go to was brokehipster.com uh, because I was I'm, I'm a hipster and I'm bro I was broke back then, uh, and it would just list all the like bars that had happy hours and stuff. But it would have been cool to have an app. <laughs> Where I just enter in like, you know, whatever mood, have some friends and suggest the appropriate bars because I've ended up in some weird bars in Chicago, uh, weird places. Uh, Eric, uh, go to you. Follow up questions or thoughts or anything? Nope, definitely give me some good stuff to good stuff to dig into. Serge, sorry, I think Serge might want to say something else. Yeah, yeah, no, I just. Oh, sorry. No, just very quickly, no. I'll interject. You you said a, about being broke. You would have loved my app then. <laughs> Fortunately, like venture capitalists, they're they're looking for people with money, right? So, uh, you know, apps for broke people, it's it's not their market, right? Um, but um, you know, like my app was okay. You just shake your phone and you get random things to do, and and you you have the free option. You can make sure they're free things to do, right? Too, so. Um, not something that would impress a venture capitalist, but I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> I absolutely love it for one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Eric, I'm, I'm curious to, like, uh, can you talk about this use case, this project that you're working on? Is it something like that's kind of proprietary? For yeah, work? Sure. Yeah, let's hear it. No, it's just my, it's just my own thing. So I, so I like tea, um, and it's just like, I, so many people have said like find a topic you really like and do a project on it but like i don't have a ton of those things where i would want to do a project about it but over the past like couple of years i've just gotten into tea and and so i thought i wonder if i can find anything online like an interesting tea data set or if i can make a tea data set or maybe there's something out there like ratings and recommending teas well there 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 are a couple of sites out there with lots of that are dedicated to tea and people who are drinking it and people who are like writing reviews and things like that. But neither of the major sites actually like have anything that recommends stuff. You can just kind of see a ranking, a, a general ranking. And so I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can get all of their data or at least a, a big chunk of it and then turn it into something that I can use as a recommender. Both, And the reason that it's creating kind of an interesting project is that the site that I'm like working from is actually like a T social network. So, so there are people who are connected, T's that they have rated. And so I have a number between like, you know, zero and a hundred. And so I can be able to say, all right, well, you know, I can just do something simple, like, you know, collaborative filtering algorithm, you know, to recommend teas to you based on other people who like similar teas. Fine. Um, but the other piece that I think is potentially really interesting is recommending people that you might want to follow or be connected to. 
and taking kind of like a graph approach to it because I think that I think that the social networks are interesting. They're problematic because they can be very divisive. So what if the recommendations for people to connect to are people that will like help increase the overall connectivity of the network rather than like increasing the polarization of the network? So I'm curious about how how recommendations might be made either through people or through items to say, you know, you have like this tea in common with somebody who otherwise is rather different from you with the idea that it can then help you like broaden your perspectives and just instead of just helping you find more like sweet fruity teas rather it can help you find things that you and this person both like this thing and you have kind of not really so much overlapping other tastes but enough so that we think you might you might help broaden one another's horizons and potentially draw the network together a little bit. So kind of a, a cool, a cool data set that I'm, I'm still working on building, but then just like a, a concept of recommenders and social networks that I think is philosophically interesting. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I remember you're, you're doing some research into like uh, serendipity recommender systems like yeah. for this particular project. It was not, it was just, because I think it's a cool subject, but this is like how I like somewhere to apply it to be able to say, how do we, how do we create serendipitous connections here? So yeah, kind of grew um, into it. You mentioned you're, you're building the data set. Like that's something that I don't think, you know, a lot of data scientists really have a ton of experience doing is actually like building and curating a data set. What are like some of the considerations you have to make when I, I mean, I, first of all, I guess, what's, what's that look like? How's the, how's like mechanically the process look like and then once like you got the mechanics down how do you determine what's included in your training data what's not so right now it's probably and as far as like the the format of it it's probably a clunky format um because but you know it's what i've thought to do so i'm going to do it um as one important consideration is that I, i'm so i'm i'm scraping this they don't have an api it's an older it's an older site, but the thing that's great about it being an older site is it's also somewhat simple. So it's not always being like, they're not making tons of changes. It's not a lot of like dynamic elements. And so I'm able, like right now I'm, I'm using Selenium to scrape it, which is nice because I can actually just like sit there and watch the scraping, you know, be like, it pulled up that page. Oh, it pulled up that page again. Crap, something's wrong, you know? And so I can go back and work through my code and eventually I'll figure out a way to make it like headless. Um, but for now that's, that's how I'm doing it. And I'm using a lot of, um, dictionaries just so the way that I'm scraping it is to say like this person's profile and who are their like followers and how many followers do they have in like a sub dictionary. And so it's kind of dictionaries all the way down. Maybe, well, I guess there are some lists in there, but lots of dictionaries to, um, keep track and also help feed the next like iteration of like, who should I go, who should I crawl to next to crawl through the whole algorithm or the whole like data set or as far as I want it to go. And as far as your thought about like how much data or which things to grab, that's, that's a tough question. And what I'm trying to do in writing my functions for it is I'm, I'm trying to write them in such a way that if later I want to go back and I want to grab something new. Like, let's say that first I grab all the ratings for a T, but I didn't grab the actual reviews or I didn't grab, say, the ingredients. I could write something that will go and update that dictionary entry potentially. For now, I'm, I'm trying to like grab enough stuff at the beginning to like give me something interesting to work with. But I, I know that I'm going to forget something and I'm going to want to be able to, you know, bolt it, bolt it on later. Uh, and have it be a, a continue, hopefully a continuous, useful data set. If anybody got any tips for Eric, feel free to share them uh, in the chat or contact Eric directly. Um, Serge, Serge said that serendipity was uh, what his startup was all about. So talk to us about that real quick, Serge. What was your startup all about? Oh, it was about the paradox of choice. So essentially you're paralyzed, uh, you know, deciding what to do you know, typical Friday night, I have no idea, you know, what to do, right? And so like you spend so much time 
either discussing with yourself, your significant other, a group of friends, what to do, how to optimize this problem, right? And you end up over optimizing something and you lose the, the, the serendipity, right? Uh, the, the sense of exploration. And, um, and then eventually, like, once you arrive at a conclusion, you say, we're going to do this, you have very high expectations. It's just uh, the way, you know, psychology works. The more, the more effort we put into something, the higher expectations are, right? So then you don't enjoy it because it doesn't meet those extremely high expectations. You know, something that could have been fun and the spontaneous ended up being, a, you know, not meeting um, every expectation. So, yeah, that, it, it was born out of that, you know? It's supposed to be like a fun app for people to use um you know monetize through um you know not exactly um advertising but um the, the ability for small businesses to capture an audience of people that would stumble upon them accidentally so um it had also the tinder mechanism of you know swipe left and right so we could learn from people so it was quasi random that that was the approach not quite random just quasi you know <laughs> So uh, still recommending, but not in also, you know, a good mix between exploration and exploitation, essentially. I like that a lot. I feel like that's something that, you know, in this COVID, post-COVID, we're still in COVID kind of era, is an app that would thrive. I mean, it's like a lot of the trends are just like wanting to be local everything, right? Like my wife yeah. and I, for example, we're like 100% loyal to local, like, you know, you look at most of the sweat tricks we got, it's Winnipeg. <laughs> like all the beers that we get, wines, whatever, it's local. Uh, that's pretty interesting. And we very much well described uh, our weekends where it's we want to go out to eat. There's so many options. And what can we do? We go to the same place every weekend because uh, why not? Why not just exploit the hell out of what we already like? Yeah. Uh, see if there's any other questions or comments. Uh, on this particular topic, do you let me know? I had Monitoring one other question. Yeah, yeah, please go for it. This is totally not related to recommender systems, so totally different. So we know, like, it's hopefully, uh, you know, pretty common for people to be documenting and pushing their code using version control for things that are like software projects, machine learning projects, things like that. Things that like you're going to have lots of different moving parts and whatever. <clears throat> but um, at work, one thing we're trying to do right now is get the overall like analytics organization, including those that are not doing machine learning, who like primarily the, the primary code language for them is going to be SQL. And we don't necessarily need version control, but if you win the lottery or get hit by a bus, we want to know where your code is or what your code is and stuff like that, right? Um, people think I'm morbid for saying if you get hit by a bus, but I mean, it could happen. It's more likely to happen than winning the lottery, frankly, um, I think. So anyway, have any of you like the thing, the thing that I'm running up against right now is like, I have many queries that I have written some of which we'll never see the light of day again. And that's fine. Um, I just needed it for a thing. So, and I think that many of my coworkers have the same situation. I like pushing stuff to GitLab because it like helps me feel like I have less risk, helps me feel like I'm doing things hopefully clean. Um, and it encourages me to document stuff because somebody may see it later and judge me. Uh, and so I just think it's a good idea but other people don't necessarily share that interest. And so like, how would you prioritize, I guess, like what kinds of stuff when it comes to queries, how do you decide what you're going to, what's like reusable enough that you're going to need to use it later versus something where you're just like, it's, you know, throw away query or is it, did you, is it, is it even something that's part of an analysis or is it just like a quick number that you're pulling or I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how to prioritize that so that I can give something that is like pretty, like I'm on the working group to help make this happen. I want something to be clear where it's like, this is what I want you to do. Don't worry about anything else. Just do this one simple thing. I'd love some thoughts on that. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Vin and then after Vin, let's go to uh, Christian. I'm digging back into my brain, but 
I think you can actually log every query run, right? You can log it and the query itself and that gets stored. You can actually enable logging for that. And if you just put some comments into each one of the queries, talking about what it is that you did, you can end up just doing some basic extraction and have a database of queries with like a purpose and mm -hmm. that that's ugly, but it, you know, it's the easiest, lowest effort thing that I could think of off the top of my head. And if you're, I mean, you should be logging what everyone's doing query wise, just as a best practice mm -hmm. and you probably never go to, you know, find somebody being a bad actor, but you never know as far as data governance is concerned, that's just a really good thing to have just in case you need it, but you can also start using it as potential, like a scraping grounds for migrating it into something more formal as a source control. But that way you have, and I mean, it's not going to take up a whole lot of space because most queries aren't, you know, these massive 10 gig files or anything. So right. keeping all of that, you know, with the description, like I said, just strip out the comments, you know, and put that into a description field. And if you see similarities between five or six queries in the description field, that could be something that you key off of where you start saying, yeah, people are doing the same activity or something similar mm -hmm. multiple times. You know, there's some, like I said, it's, I'm throwing a kludge out there, but it's low effort. So people will actually do it. Yeah. Are you thinking, so when you say that, like if I ran a query, let's just say, you know, show me sales from this last month. Mm -hmm. And then I run the same query that says, actually, show me sales from the last month and the month before that. Is that going to, so that's going to be like a register, two times of a thing yep. that's registered, right? Yeah. Every so time you for, run something, you end up logging it. Yeah. So when you talk about like using, as far as like scraping it or cleaning that to create mm -hmm. some sort of a final data product, do you, are you saying like, I guess what I was thinking is like, when I get to the end of that, do I put like, some sort of a tag on it that's like something that wouldn't normally be in someone's query so that it's easy to like go find grab what's ever between those tags and, and grab that piece or how do you avoid the problem of me running that same query five times while i figure out what i keep doing wrong <laughs> yeah, i mean well, no, you're gonna, hypothetically you're, speaking i know somebody who's done that you're gonna log all your mistakes which yeah i get it it's it's going to be embarrassing but it's okay. Everybody makes them. So it's not that big of a deal. And you could almost even, and like I said, just put it in comments. You know, that's all you, you would end up doing is just commenting and then extract the comments from the query. Mm -hmm. That That's it. You know, I wouldn't make it any harder than that because if you ask people to do anything harder than that, they won't. But asking them to put sure. like a one line description in there. I, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure you could get most people to say yes to that especially if you're going to help them by pro providing them a repository of frequently run queries, which they'll realize very quickly. It's way easier to just pull searching by text description than it is to rewrite the same query, you know, even if it's five lines, to rewrite the same thing 45 times. And, you know, the eight mistakes that you make every single time, you kind of bring up a good point where it's, yeah, we all kind of forget that one piece and yeah, distinctly worse. Yes, distinctly worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, it's kind of kludgy. Oh. I would, you know, I would just take that as me throwing out a theme and, you know, improve on it, figure out how to do it better. Yeah, SQL comments are not pretty anyway. So there's probably a smarter way to do that. So Eric, just so, you know, more clarity on, on, the, on the problem. So it's like, it's not version control of the actual code that you're running against the database. That's the issue. It's like you're iterating on your code and you could be creating, you know, queries that just aren't spitting that right answer. And because you keep iterating on your code and hitting the, the database with, with these queries, it's slowing stuff down. Am I can I understand the problem a little bit more? Like that no, it's, it's more like, that? it's more like, so I, I wrote a query that creates, um, like a run rate for our marketing KPIs for the month based on the past couple of weeks or whatever. So I wrote that query, but maybe I have never pushed that to GitLab, which means it lives on my machine and my machine only. 
And if I win the lottery and never come back and then my computer gets my computer gets wiped, somebody else is going to have to rewrite that query or they're going to have to stumble upon it because I happen to put it in a Tableau workbook and nobody actually realized that, that was powering Tableau workbook. Right. So it's just like, how are we we want? We, we recognize that there there could be work that is being duplicated where people are running similar queries, um, but they don't necessarily need to because we may have something, you know, somebody else may be doing a similar thing, possible. And then that the other piece is just kind of that risk management piece of like, we don't have a central repository of queries because they don't need to be version controlled. It's just you just run the query and get the thing that you need. Let's hear from uh, Christian and then we'll do uh, Coastal. Yeah, so I'm kind of in my world hearing two halves here. And the first half is the version control piece, which if you invest in a given BI tool, like say Looker for me, I guess I'm biased, but um, that is all connected to a Git repository. So in my environment right now, all of that version control is taken care of in the natural flow of dev test to prod code migration. Um, but as far as like documenting code um, of query or documenting scripts or queries that your team is routinely running on say like a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, um, to be honest, a great tactic that I had at the startup that I was at was to just put everything into a Google Sheet or a shared um, Microsoft Office Word doc and or uh, Excel doc rather, um, and then keep, continually update it. And it's a little bit more manual that way, but I have found that that's super helpful um, as a central point for all of your teammates to go back to for a given report. And then on top of that, also using that sheet for any kind of queries that are needed for feature engineering uh, for uh, features in your warehouse down the road for data science projects. But yeah, it's kind of different because for me, like, yeah, Looker takes care of a lot of that version control. To be honest, we probably could do a little bit better. I could probably do a better job even of logging some of those things. I always make sure to update my deployments with notes and everything so that, you know, you, a piece of uh, code, you know what you're looking at um, for a given commit and deploy, but, um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I would say. Cool. And uh, th there might be something worth checking out. Like, I, I don't know if it's going to be overkill for a particular use case, but definitely check it out. It's called Dolt, D-O-L-T. Uh, they call mm -hmm. themselves Git for Data. I mean, everybody calls themselves Git for Data, but um, this thing, like, you can fork, clone, branch, merge, push, pull, like, entire databases, uh, just like mm -hmm. you would in Git. So I'm not sure if that's overkill for what you're trying to do, but just something, something to just peek at. Uh, Coast of the Uh Yeah, actually, Christian stole some of my answers, so <clears throat> I feel a little bit uh, left out here. Now, um, so like here's the thing, right? What Christian's trying to get down to is that not everything is a problem that we necessarily need to solve by design, right? We have a we have a mentality as as technical people or as engineers or, or, you know, the scientists to try and solve things by the technical design uh, that we have in front of us. And part of that is using our tools like uh, Git, right? Um, and yes, that may be the perfect way to solve it, where there is like an API endpoint that they can call every single time. Uh, but that's not necessarily the most, that's, that's, an, that's a highly engineered way of doing it, right? And yeah, it, it, could, it could solve your problems, but you need to retain a certain degree of flexibility by the sounds of it, where you can adjust that query um, each time, right? So when you start looking at that, it's less about, that, that's where design breaks down. That's where you can over-engineer yourself into a corner, right? Um, so the way I like to look at it is design, it's like, it's like risk management, right? Design, if you can, uh, process what you must and leave to expertise as little as as little as humanly possible. Because what you're talking about is actually knowledge transfer more than versioning for that particular SQL query. Like you don't care about the version. Yeah. All you care about is exactly. that someone else knows what it is you do, right? And this is where if you can't design it into the system where there is only one possible way where it can work and it's super clear how that's tied into everything else, then 
your better bet is to at least document it into uh, work instruction, a, a guide of some sort. And uh, that that's essentially, that's a lot of what I've been doing in terms of some of the things that we do on a weekly basis. Um, I've documented that. And the good thing is, rather than that living with just me, I'm able to delegate that out to other people in my team uh, and upskill them and train them up into that so that, hey, if I need to take time off, even for a couple of weeks, the trains keep running on time, right? It shouldn't be so dependent on my expertise being there uh, for the whole thing to, you know, keep running on time. And that's something we do really badly because we like to uh, not show people a, a half-baked process of thinking. We like to say, hey, here's this nice endpoint or script that just works when you hit go. We can't engineer all of life away, right? Like that just, we, we'd be here for lifetimes trying to do that. And by then it'd get away from us anyway. So at some level, just documenting that into and saying, hey, um, this is what I usually run on a weekly basis. This is the baseline for it. Here's a few examples of how I've run it differently. You know, here's a couple of adjustments on it. And these are the outputs that I got. This is what I was looking for when I went to that adjustment, right? Now, anyone like can come along and you could train them, people on your team. But conversely, the other part of it is let go, man. If you're going to get eaten by a shark while you're walking down the road, and the reason I use that rather than right hit, up, hit by a bus is just to defend myself legally, that, you know, disclaimer, there's very low chance of you getting eaten by a shark walking down the road. Um, but if you do, trust that the company's going to hire someone who's just as good as you, right, or good enough to understand what it is you do to pick up where you left off or to come at it and say, actually, this guy's a dope. I can do it a lot better, right? Uh, like, we, we have this, because we are problem solvers and we've solved a lot of problems, um, especially at the companies we're at, they treat us like we are the go-to person to solve a lot of problems. And then we, that builds into our ego, into our identity, and we say, hey, we're the go-to guy to solve all these problems. And we love being that. We're data scientists, we're, we're ML engineers, we're, we're problem solvers, right? We love being that person that is the go-to guy for it, right? Um, it's a dangerous thinking because then we back ourselves into this corner where we pile up all this pressure that we're the only person who can solve it. That's not true. There's a lot of smart people out there. Trust that they'll figure it out. Uh, document it as best you can. And then hey, you get in by shark, you get in by shark. Speaking of smart people, Church says, I wish Mikiko was here. She would know the optimal best practice. That is absolutely true. She probably won't. Uh, thank you very much, Kosa. Thank you very much, everyone. Eric, does that give you any type of clarity on the right path? Any follow-up questions or anything? That was really helpful. Uh, I think I think pointing out or going to when I, you know, talk with the person who's kind of managing it, I wanna I think I'm gonna try and focus more on like knowledge transfer and understanding and helping like drive that home because you know the person who's in charge of it has very much like a a version control background and you know lots of experience using that it's like well this is this is something that's a little different and so i i don't want to over engineer it because that, that's exhausting um for for me and everyone involved and right now people a lot of people don't have much experience with git so they just kind of feel like it's a a harder version of saving something to Google Drive. And, you know, they're kind of right. Uh, and so this is this is helpful. If we think of knowledge transfer, I think that will be helpful in prioritizing, you know, like if you knew that next week you weren't going to be here anymore because you were going to win the lottery, then like, what would you, what would you tell us so that we could do, do a job in your stead, you know, or something, I guess. So I think maybe that'll help simplify the, the ask as well. Thank you. Awesome. Great questions, Eric. Um, any other uh, questions or comments? I don't see anything coming out on LinkedIn or on YouTube. Uh, Tashi is watching on YouTube. Tashi, thank you for watching on YouTube. I appreciate you having me there. Um, do not see any other questions or anything coming through. Uh, I guess we start to wind this down. Give you guys an opportunity. Three, two, one all right does not look like it well thank you all so much for hanging out today i uh, appreciate y'all being here uh, the uh, 
everybody that's hanging out in Salt Lake City just for joining in, even if it was for a few minutes, just having a video on them. That's so much to me. Thank you all for, uh, for just making the effort. Appreciate you guys. Um, remember to tune in this Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time. That is uh, August the 10th, doing a live stream interview. I haven't done an interview in eight months. I think the last time I recorded an interview from my podcast was like in December of last year. So let's see if I still got it. Let's see if I could still ask questions and have an engaging conversation. Uh, but we're going uh, to be chatting with the folks from uh, Tonic AI, the fake data company. Uh, I'm excited for it. It will be a great, great chat. Hopefully, hopefully I'll be in the, uh, in the studio. If not, um, the co working spot on that has a, uh, what they call a podcast. Um, I don't know why I haven't been using it uh, this entire time. But anyways, uh, tune into that. It'll be a great, great time. Um, we'll be taking questions from the audience and everything. So once Tonic AI, the fake data company, uh, and shout out to you guys for sponsoring that, uh, that episode. Appreciate that. Uh, that's it for today, my friends. Y'all have a good weekend. Uh, if you got any questions on anything, I haven't heard from, uh, from, from, from people in the audience in a long time. So remember, you can always shoot me an email at the artists of data science at gmail.com. I would love to hear from y'all for a, so, so shoot me an email, y'all. Uh, take care. Have a great week, weekend. My friends, you got one life on this planet. Why not try to do something good? Cheers, everyone.